Mike's Daily Podcast. F F episode 1199. Yes, we're almost at 1200. 1200. Wow, we're almost there. Mike Matthews broadcasting from Cafe Anyway, located somewhere in Pod Castro Valley, Mont. Today we hear from Shelley Shuhart, Floyd the Floorman, John Deere the Engineer, plus the return of the interesting news segment. Mike's Daily Podcast. Do you know Dat? Where we're going to tell you some interesting things you probably did not know about. So now you will know Dat. Mike's Daily Podcast. Well, yesterday when I was walking Basil the Boxer in Podcastro Valley, Mont. Well, I guess. I talk about my dog a lot on this show, but that's okay. We were walking along yesterday and ran into two very beautiful women who were like, "Your dog is cute." Mike's daily podcast. And I am going to try not to say the word "like," as my, I know that is my crutch word. I use it Mike's a lot daily. And I work Podcast. in the talk radio world. Yeah, I produce a lot of shows for different people, and I notice people people's crutches. This one guy I record, he says again a lot. Again, I ran into a couple of women while I was walking my dog. Again, I keep saying that. Well, these were two lovely, cute Asian ladies, and when they saw Basil. They both, in unison, went ooh, and they started petting Basil, and Basil was really happy. But then Basil wanted to go into their house, and I'm like, "Dude," I said, "Like again?" I said, "Dude, that's not cool. You can't just walk into people's houses you don't even know." And the two girls were like, "Ah, dang it!" The two girls said to me. Hey, your dog wants to go into our house, and I said yes. And they said he can't go in, and I go,、oh, I know. But they were very nice, and they they wanted to know what kind of dog Basil was. There were some other people too in Podcaster Valley at their truck, the food truck place, and this lady came up to Basil and started petting him. Basil is a chick magnet, is what I'm trying to say. But oh, look who look who just walked in. Hello, Mike Matthews. It's Shelly Shuhart, the good dog supervisor. I am not magnetized to your dog. <coughs> and and why is that? Because <coughs> he's so gross. My dog is gross. How dare you? No, Mike Matthews. It's true. Yeah. He's got like all this stuff coming out of his mouth all the time. Not all the time. Occasionally there'll be some drool. But that's just. A dog thing. You 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 carry a lot of napkins and towels with you. It helps solve that issue. Okay, whatever, Mike Matthews. I think those girls liked you yesterday. They were maybe. It is interesting though. I now I I know that this is going to sound a little weird, but if you ask a lot of dog owners. It's interesting to see how certain generations and certain types of people do not like dogs. If you go to the peninsula, look who else just walked in. If you go to the peninsula side of the Bay Area, lots of people don't like big dogs. They're into smaller dogs. I think it's because there's not enough room for the big dogs. So they see. When I walk Basil over in the peninsula side, I get a lot of people crossing the street to get. You know, as far away from my dog as possible, that kind of thing. Not so much in Podcaster Valley. Ah, Podcaster Valley is so scary. But occasionally, you see older people. They'll look at Basil and go, "Ah,"、oh, and they'll try and cross the street. And I'm like, "No, no, no! You're old. Don't cross the street. I will do it because I'm respectful to the old people." And they're like, "Thank you, young person." No, I'm not young. I'm I'm getting I'm in the old person er- zone. But the neither here nor there. I also wanted to tell you about how I had a conversation with my dog. I don't know what that sound effect was, but 
Uh, no, not with my dog, with my na uh, roommate, the guy that lives with us. He's a human. And he sometimes feeds Basil the Boxer, and he and I were talking about British TV shows. And he said to me, Mike, you sure watch a lot of British TV stuff. And I go, yeah, well, I like British TV shows because the people seem more real. When you watch American shows, everybody's young and good-looking, and there's basically something dead that comes back to life. Every show's got, like, dead people coming back to life. I was talking to Marco a minute ago. No, he's not on today's show doing the Marco Minute, which sounds like this. The Marco Minute. The Marco Minute. We're not doing that today, though. But I was saying to him, yeah. It, it, there, there's like shows like what was that show where the people, the returners, or the people, the left behinders, or the 800, where people were dead and they came back, and then there's the zombie ones, and uh, there's so many. But British TV shows, people, they have the wrinkles like normal people. They've got messed up teeth like normal people. They've got these odd ways of. When they act, they don't do the specific sort of general hospital soap opera style of acting, CW style of acting. I just get so sick of it. Everything is the same. When the CW came out with shows like the big, what was the big one? Dawson's Creek. And here's today's podcast picture. It's a picture of Dawson's Creek. No, it's a picture of Benicia. Downtown Benicia, there's a beach. And I was there with Basil the Boxer. And there was a beautiful sunset was going on. And well, you don't see the sunset, but you see it's implied. And behind me is Martinez, the town of Martinez. And there's this little beach you can let your dogs run around on. So I was there taking a picture with Basil. See that picture now at mikesdailypodcast.com, as well as all the past podcast pictures and past interviews and past shows. Although I'm, I'm, you know, the interviews I do, that's kind of fun, but I'm noticing I don't get as many listens to the show, not as many downloads when I have guests on the show, when I have interviews and people on. Isn't that interesting? I don't know what that is. People don't, they, they are, I guess, more interested in the new stuff, which we're going to get to in a moment. You can help out the show through the Amazon link. And click on that whenever you're going to buy anything on Amazon, and that helps us out. And there's also the PayPal. You'll get a special greeting from all the Cafe Anyway characters. And I just forgot that two other guys walked in. Oh, my, this is Floyd the Foreman. And this is John Deere, the engineer. I fixed my water heater. Oh, good. Yay. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Water heaters are a pain in the butt. Yeah, that's for sure. So are lions. Wow, Mike, where did that lion come from? I don't know. We were watching some MGM movie and he just popped up out of nowhere. <sighs> MGM movies and their lions. That was actually, did you know that the, the lion sound effect, they actually took a lot, they, they, to make the sound effect for the lion in those MGM movies, they had to add like a gorilla sound effect on top of it. And I said like about 15 times there in that sentence. Thank you so much for being there to help me get over my crutch, which is saying the word like. Now I wanted to ask you this question. What do you think of all this craziness going on in the world? Well, let's dive into it in our news segment. Well, actually, yesterday, I forgot to put in the news random intro liner thingy. So let's put that in right now. News random. News random. News random. I think we took care of that. We covered that. And now, today's segment. It's Bison Bentley's Do You Know Dad? Hey, this is Bison Bentley. Mike Matthews has a couple of stories that'll make you want to ask yourself, Do you know that? Do you know that? Do you know that? Do you know Thank that? you, Bison Bentley. Did you enjoy the second debate? 
Today is the third debate, the last debate. Thank God this is going to be done with. I'm so sick of Donald Trump's conspiracy theories. I'm sick of, well, Fox News is always going to have conspiracy theories. Trump is always going to have conspiracy theories. After he's gone, basically, when he's done, when this election's over with, he is going to start a huge media empire. He's already in talks with it. He's already got someone from Breitbart, the biggest right-wing conservative conspiracy theorist website for blogs and uh, all, you know, all their reporting is on Breitbart, named after that guy Breitbart who died much too young. But when he, just before he did, it was during the 99 percenters that were protesting and he was caught on tape coming up to one of the guys hitting the drums and being a 99 percenter protesting but playing his drums and he's yelling at him going don't you know what an idiot you are you're like a guy from the jungle he yelled at him so that was Breitbart but now there's a whole website named after him and a huge empire so Donald Trump is going to get cash in on that Is Ken Bone going to be cashing in on that? Well, he appeared in the second debate during the town hall discussion. Now, during your town hall discussion debates, that's when you get these people that suddenly rise to notoriety for no notoriety, no reason. There was that guy, Joe the Plumber. Remember that during the John McCain, Obama debate? And now we have Ken Bone. He became an instant internet sensation. But the fan base turned against him quickly last Thursday. Bone, the rotund man in a red sweater who went viral after his question during the second presidential debate, has come under fire after a series of comments he supposedly made online. Bone opened up during a Reddit Ask Me Anything session. This was on Thursday using the username StanGibson18. But news outlets quickly discovered that Bone's username has been linked to some eyebrow-raising posts in the past. The same username had crudely discussed hacked nude images of Jennifer Lawrence, discussed pregnant porn, and quipped about committing felony insurance fraud. He also seemingly commented on the controversial shooting of Trayvon Martin. This was on Thursday. This according to MSN.com. Bone, for one, didn't seem very affected by the backlash. Late Thursday, he tweeted a link promoting merchandise that features his face. Because he's cashing in, y'all. Because he's Ken Boone. Another interesting thing you may not know is what the right-wing media was harping on yesterday to the max about this... Quid pro quo. You probably heard quid pro quo eight gazillion times if you're watching Fox News or listening to right wing radio. FBI official Brian McCauley has been trying for weeks to get his contract at the State Department to approve his request to put two bureau employees back in Baghdad. Around May of 2015, Patrick Kenny finally called back. He said, Brian, Pat Kennedy, I need a favor, McCauley recalled in an interview. Yesterday, I said, good, I need a favor. I need our people back in Baghdad. Quid pro quo is what that is. Something for something. Then Kennedy, a longtime State Department official, explained he want what he wanted in return. He said, there's an email. I don't believe it has to be classified. The email was from Hillary Clinton's private server, and Kennedy wanted the FBI to change its determination that it contained classified information. Macaulay and others ultimately rejected the request, but the interaction, which Macaulay said lasted just minutes over maybe two conversations, has become the latest focal point of the bitter 2016 presidential campaign. Because they got nothing else. Because this is all they have to talk about. That and that the media is trying to put Trump down because of the bus conversation. Oh, that was planned. That bus conversation tape, bus gate was leaked just before the second debate. It was all conspiracy. And it, the truth is, NBC had been sitting, sitting on that tape. 
And were, they were going to sit on that tape some more until it got leaked. Leaked. Yes, leaked to the Washington Post. So the conspiracy theory there is uh, nothing. It was The conspiracy was that it was going to be held probably all the way till after the election. And we would never have known the things that Trump had said about women and, you know, the actual smoking gun. Well, in an hour-long interview this, uh, with the Washington Post, the first comments on the matter, Macaulay acknowledged that he offered to do a favor in exchange for another favor, but before he had any inkling of what Kennedy wanted. The FBI and the State Department have denied that Macaulay and Kennedy ever engaged in quid pro quo. Now that's up to debate, because it obviously is quid pro quo, but... The Democrat, the uh, Hillary critics have suggested, the people against Hillary have suggested that the conversation between the State Department and FBI demonstrated inappropriate collusion to the benefit of Clinton. Macaulay, who has since retired from the FBI, no longer works for them, said he has asked Kennedy to send him the email in question and then inquired with another bureau official about it because he had only a partial understanding of the request. And Macaulay said when he learned the missive concerned the attack on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi, he told Kennedy he could not help him. I said, absolutely not. I cannot help you. And he took that and was fine. Macaulay who was the FBI's Deputy Assistant Director for International Operations from 2012 to 2015. In a statement released by the State Department, Kennedy said he reached out because he wanted to better understand a proposal the FBI had made to upgrade one of former Secretary Clinton's emails prior to its public release. And Macaulay raised the topic of FBI slots in Iraq as an entirely separate matter. He said he could not speak to Macaulay's recollection, but insisted there was no quid pro quo nor was there any bargaining. At no point in our conversation was I under the impression we were bargaining. Kennedy also said in the statement his motivations were not political. As we go outside a cafe anyway, where we bring you Mike's Daily Podcast somewhere in Podcaster Valley. He also said, by the way, I have served as a member of the Foreign Service for some 40 years, serving both Democratic and Republican and Republican administrations. So everybody trying to make Kennedy out to be this total Democratic shill that does whatever the Democrats ask. He says, my sole aim was to ensure that we were responsive to our legal obligations. Now, there was one other story before we wrap up the show today that just came out about Harry Shearer. Harry Shearer does a ton of voices on The Simpsons. He does the the preacher guy. Well, talks like this. He does hidely ho. Ned Flanders is probably voting for Trump even though he doesn't want to because he's not a Christian. And then there's what else? He does this. Oh, the old rich guy, Burns, Mr. Burns. And some others. And a a bunch of others. A host of others. He has launched a $125 million fraud and contract breach lawsuit against Vivendi and Studio Canal for over the uh, 1984 Rockumentary classic, This is Spinal Tap. This goes up to 11. That was the big joke. You know what I noticed? You have to like that movie if you are A, a musician, B, white, C, male, and D, old. My kind of old. Middle-aged old. It doesn't seem to appeal to millennials... Or, like, my ex-wife didn't like it. It's sort of this thing where you're... I don't, some people... A lot of people that I talk to go, I don't understand why people go nuts over this movie. But there it is. It's a cult classic. The complaint filed on Monday in California federal court is packed with enough nuggets to instantly make this a must-watch Hollywood accounting case. Through the lawsuit, Shear also reveals he is attempting to grab back rights to the film and its continually popular contract, this according to MSN and The Hollywood Reporter. Harry Shearer, known for his big voices on The Simpsons, co-created the semi He does 23 characters, by the way, on The Simpsons. Co-created the semi-fake band Spinal Tap in the 70s with Christopher Guest and Michael McKean. And if you... By the way, if you do enjoy Spinal Tap, watch... The folk mockumentary 
called a, a, a Mighty Wind. It's not as good as Spinal Tap, but it is funny and has to do with the, the folk world. The movie, directed by Rob Reiner, this is Final Tap, and featuring Harry Shearer as basic Derek Smalls, was produced and released by Embassy Pictures. After tremendous reviews and a series of transactions, rights to Final Tap landed in the hands of Avendi, the French conglomerate which once had the ambition of becoming one of the largest studios in the entertainment industry. Despite the film's legacy and Spinal Tap's enduring success as a commercial band able to sell out arenas, yes, they are still able to sell out arenas, Shearer's company called Century of Progress Productions alleges that four lead, that the the four lead creatives, being Harry Shearer, Christopher Guest, uh, Michael McKean, and Rob Reiner, have received just $81 in merchandising income. Yes, $81. And $98 in musical sales. This, for the past three decades, is how much they have made. Wow. According to the complaint, the original 1982 production agreement called for Shearer, McCain, Guest, and Reiner to get 40% of net receipts. In Hollywood, though, calculating contingent profit participation often triggers disputes that go up to 11. This one certainly did. The lawsuit raises two accounting issues in particular that figure to draw attention. Vivendi is accused of cross-collateralizing unsuccessful films bundled with This Is Final Tap in their accounting. That's called straight-lining. Vivendi is also... Uh, Vivendi is also charged with not doing an honest job managing the flow of payments through its subsidiaries at a time when vertically integrated companies in entertainment continue to set off problems the complaint speaks how the soundtrack music rights are owned by Vivendi subsidiary Universal Music Group and that they have a right or have uh, and they are said to have an obligation to pay Vivendi subsidiary Canal with other accounting improprieties alleged, such as undocumented marketing expenses and improper deductions, Shear's lawsuit references the Copyright Act's termination provisions, which allow authors to cancel grants and retain rights after 35 years. He wants to cash in on the songs that he co-wrote and co-recorded, and as well as the film. The Vivendi would potentially lose rights to This Is Final Tap in 2019. Copyright termination has been a big subject in the music industry, and it's only beginning to impact the film business, so expect to hear more about these sort of things. And it also talks about uh, that Shearer says his manager received assurances from co-defendant Ron Halpern uh, that everything was okay, but now accuses him of deception. And says that in anticipation of the film's 30th anniversary in 2013, it commissioned a study of accounting statements and revenue streams and then first discovered that Vivendi had engaged in a pattern of anti-competitive and unfair business practices. The lawsuit discusses everything from how the defendants allegedly let others, including one brewing company, register Spinal Tap at the trademark office without opposition. And Shearer implies he's been stopped from reprising his famous character. Derek Smalls.